theory on lifespan. Um, Daniel Levinson, uh, it's a bit later actually than I said earlier, 1978 he brought out the best-selling book, Seasons of a Man's Life. One of the striking things about it, I think, is that he breaks um, the ages of the phases of life down into much smaller sections. You know, so like from 23 to 28, from 30 to 32, and you know, I'm not sure how much of it is now, but it'd be interesting to see, won't it? So. And is this 40 anymore? Life starts at 40, but the very anxiety that it ends there, 40 is not 40 anymore, is it? You know? What is the new 40? 60. 60, right. Later on, Levinson also brought out theories of woman's life in 1996, as I said. Um, but it's the, this, this book here that guided a lot of lifespan theory for m uh, many years. So, <coughs> Levinson. Um, there was kind of the era he was into. He was born in 1920, died in 1994 from New York City. He had a kind of distinguished education, um, so he was educated at Berkeley um, and then went on to start his career at Harvard and then eventually ended up in, in Yale. Um, but his work was, was fundamentally built on that of Eric Erickson. Um, and you'll see the similarities really in the stages. But he added something I think which was, was quite, um, quite useful. The theory he built really was based on his study of only uh, 40 American men. Now, you might think, well that's not a lot, but it depends on the depth of the study. Sometimes um, uh, the study into a small group of people, if it's done on a qualitative basis, um, looking into their phenomenological experience of living, can be incredibly ins insightful. And sometimes it's more insightful than doing a quantitative study of a thousand or, or ten thousand men. So it's about, which I think really fits lifespan theory, about the quality of their experience, not how many times they experience something. So when you, look, when you see that, you don't let it off put you, you know, that you think, oh, 40 men, is that it? Because it's, it, you know, a small section is often very re um, relative to larger sections. It's about the quality that's important. <coughs> they were between 30 to 35 working in um, quite professional kind of capacities. Um, so, one of the things uh, that you know we'll briefly look at later is some of the criti criticisms of Levinson's theory is, that it is on just professional men. And of course, we know that between classes, people experience different crises, don't they? You know, so there is something that, that perhaps is you know quite biased towards this group of men in particular. But hey, let, let's see what it uncovers. So he did a range of interviews um, and, and looked really at how, they, how these men experienced their life uh, uh, subjects such as education, religion and their political beliefs and major events or turning points that they experienced, just like we've been really talking about this morning. <coughs> and what he came up really with was an idea around what's called life structure. and. The, the, how, how someone's life is structured through specific stages as people age um, and relative to uh, their psychosocial, their physical age, but also um, areas such as how they experience this in relation to religion, uh, race and status, because these all play a part of, or did play a part of, of these men's experience of living. So this is really kind of what's different about uh, how Levinson described how we, tr how we kind of transist through life. He said that every sort of, around about every five years, um, we, we go through, uh, well, we go through a stable period and then we get to what's called the, tran he called the transitional period. Now start to think about this in terms of your life, because whilst it's not every five years, um, you can certainly, well, it might not be every five years for you specifically, I'm sure you can certainly uh, uh, um, appreciate that there are periods of life, maybe a generation or just before a generation is up, where you kind of have done this, this part of your life and you stop and you look back and you consider what's happened. Does that make sense? 
you look at what happened there, how has it been being 20? You know, I'm moving into my 30s now, and you consider what it was like being 20. I, I remember, um, I loved being 28 in particular. It was just a really good, it felt like a really good era of my life, where physiologically, mentally, emotionally, things really started to gel for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, I remember. 28 for me was particularly, I, I got a lot of work on exploring this. And it was around about that era that was like, wow, you know, I felt like I came together there. But of course I didn't know that at the time. It wasn't until later when I actually stopped because I was in um, a, a place then where I was making decisions about life when I looked back and looks at how things were. So he talks about how we go through stable peri uh, um, transitional periods and stable periods. We make crucial choices in life, but we look back also um, at that time as to what happened. Because that influences, doesn't it, what we decide to do next. Do you not think? Have you ever got to a stage in your life and thought to yourself, I'm not doing that again? <laughs> so you might, for example, say, God, dear, these last few years have been really tough. You know? And you tend to only be saying something like that or considering something like that when you're coming to a place of change. And you're deciding that this is how you want things to be from now on. Because you don't want to keep doing that same thing over and over again. Now, even if we don't, even if we don't, if we take out the sort of five year period, if we look at stages we go through where we're stopping, looking back, and then we're moving based on decisions we make and into another phase of life, and then we stop and then we look back. I think it's quite interesting to look at it in that, in that sense, which is something that I think Levinson added, which was quite, quite useful. Otherwise, we think that, you know, if we just take Ericsson's phases of life, we think we're just going from one phase to the next, but of course we do stop at certain points and look back, and that's often where learning comes from. <coughs> now, how this is relative to therapy is that if you can get your clients to start talking about phases of their life and what they've learned from it, this is the looking back period done from, from afar. But what you can teach them to do, in a sense, is to have that ability every now and then to reassess where they're at, to look back at what's happened, and to check, okay, this is how I want to keep living which can be quite an empowering tool for them to, to learn in therapy. So the task of the, of the stable period is to build life structure. This is where you make key choices. And uh, this is where you kind of, I guess, really reevaluate your goals and, and what your values are in life and how that's all working. And you might go through then a transitional period where a certain part of life comes to an end. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced, uh, your, you know, you have a, a group of friends when you, you grow up with and then people start occasionally getting married or, or moving away and, and it's like that period of life kind of comes to an end. It's quite difficult for some people. Some people really feel a loss there. Or another, another period you know, where this happens is when children are leaving home, for example. It happens in all, all areas of life, doesn't it? In work area, in, in relationships, friendships. To have a friendship that's lasted you know, all your life is quite a rare thing, isn't it? Because people change. People go through periods of transition themselves and they decide that they want to move in a different direction. And it's difficult. So in terms of how um, Levinson looked at these different seasons, he called them, seasons of a man's life, you can see the similarity, obviously, between Ericsson's here, but it's... The, the noticeable change is the real kind of specific breakdown in ages here and uh, I, I don't know, looking back to when this was written, if things are a little bit different now, I imagine they are. So in early adult transition he said it was around about 22. 
then you enter into the adult world at 28. I think young people are entering into the adult world a little bit sooner than that now. Do you agree? Be because they are asked to and expected to. And so then there's, after that, a transition, the age 30 transition. And then that takes to settling down at 40. Now, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of people settling down way before 40. Isn't, this is actually very true, bearing in mind how many uh, marriages end in divorce now, which is a large percentage, isn't it? People do have kind of like a second process of you know emerging through these stages perhaps in a different way you know they're not going to go right back to oh I'm becoming an adult again possibly <laughs> but it might feel like they're starting to be more who they thought they could be but never were because of the constraints of that relationship so it's very true that maybe now because people are settling down it seems much younger that there is that potential with divorce becoming an easier option that starting again in a different way is happening which you know means this kind of in a way needs updating a bit doesn't it but nevertheless midlife transition was around about 45 and then only around about 50 you entered into middle adulthood We'll look at what happens in these as we as we go through, but um, it's just a it's it's a different way of looking at it because these age ranges for me are very small, and uh, I'm not sure we fit into it like this anymore. But nevertheless, we fit into the uh, the seasons that happen or the crises that happen at, at different ages. So, in the early adult transition between 17 to 22, let's leave out the ages. Let's look at what actually the transition is. So, we leave adolescence. We make uh, choices about our adult life. Um, what are we going to do? Maybe uh, what are we going to do for work? Are we going to find a partner? Um, are we going to find somewhere to live? There are things we start thinking about at, at this age. And then we enter into the adult world. Here we start to make more concrete choices about these, these things, um, friendships, but what our values are and also what kind of lifestyle we're going to live. Now, this lasts for a while until we get to the age 30 transition um, where from Levinson's studies there is some kind of change in the life structure here which can be a moderate one so okay this person has been living with a set of values and they start maybe to become aware of they weren't my values they were other values that were given to me these are my values so this this particular period here can be where a big change happens or there's some kind of crisis um, and from there there's the period of settling down here we establish our place in society we stand up um, maybe we start to talk about right so for so many years this is going to happen and we're going to maybe even at this stage start thinking about what we're going to do for a living and when we're going to retire also we start to plan life out in a way pensions and you know we start thinking about where uh, when the children are going to leave and we start planning ahead for the future because actually you're still you're still toying around with the idea of what that's meant to be because it's different remembering that often at this stage we're still coming out of what we've inherited the ideas we've inherited as to how we should live and actually how we want to live so it's quite an un uncertain period so yeah you expect you're, you're doing what you thought you should you think you should We get into the midlife transition. We've talked a lot about that today. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Levinson talks about is w that men could struggle with here specifically is that they started to be seen as parents as opposed to brothers. This is where they start to experience that, wow, I'm not one of the lads anymore. Men are looking up to me and I'm looked at as something above and, and older. How does that bear out for women? 
we have plenty of you here, so what do you think about that? When you reach this kind of age, do you become seen as the, the mother figure, or are you still one of the girls? I remember a few years ago, um, one, of my, one of my friends uh, was getting married, and he had a stag do. And it was in Prague for the weekend. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, the bride's father, I quite, uh, uh, quite like this guy, he wasn't going to go because he said, he said, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going, I'm too old for this. I said, well, no, no, because I'm a lot older than my, my friend. And I said, well, you've got to go. I, I tell him, if you don't go, I'm not going. He went, oh, okay, then I'll go. Anyway, so um, we got there, and everyone had booked hotels, and we were in a hotel on our own. <laughs> about three miles away. So we were kind of like herded off as the oldies. I mean, I'm not old, but... It, you know, there comes a certain time where, even though you're not old, you're seen as you're not part of the gang, you know, of that era. It's a, it's a strange feeling, you know. Uh, so we, from there we move into middle adulthood. Again, another period or a phase of, of uh, stopping and then reflecting on what's, what's happened. Because this is such a massive era of, of life, isn't it? This midlife part is where so many things happen, but where most often, and this is why you'll see m the big bulk of your clients will be around this, this age, you know. Um, and, you know, this, this kind of really bears out, figures-wise, and after that it slowly, gradually goes down. Not as much as you think, actually, but here we go. This is why 60 is a new 40. But what that also means is that we're starting to encounter midlife problems a little bit later, too. That's maybe something to do with the fact that a lot of people are having second lives, in a way. Um, but below 45, it just whoo, goes right down. So a big chunk of your clients will be in this, in this, this area. Moving up to entering middle adulthood, uh, again, I would say we'd very much see a lot of this nowadays more in particular where choices are new choices, a new life structure because we've had the opportunity in midlife to say wow what is this all about what's happening here stop assess where we're at and then we make new choices for how we want to live the rest of our life because at this stage moving into here we realize that we have a finite amount of time left true you suddenly start to become aware of, you know, not preoccupied with, oh my God, I've only got so long left, but we suddenly realise, this is, we're not going to be here forever. It's an interesting profession you're moving into because, you know, a lot of therapists never retire. Because why would you? The, the older you get, the more in demand you become. Because people in this era know the wisdom and where it's coming from. And, they, and the wisdom they don't look for from a younger generation, they look at it from the older generation. As a therapist, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule that the older you are, the, the more clients you get, but you certainly are seen in a different way. When I started as a therapist, you know, in my early 20s, I was very young, um, I never had any problem getting clients, and I could never work out why, because one of my fears was I'm too young. To be, to be a therapist, but I recognised as I grew, el grew older that there was a part of me that was quite old. And it, that was the part that I worked from as a therapist. You know, biological age, emotional age, psychological age, physical age, they all vary, don't they? And the age I was working from as a therapist was not my biological age. And obviously that must have come across, because they kept coming back. So. It's a, a, such a, an important era, this, for you and the work that you'll do. So, all right, we come to um, Levinson's ideas, which is really his, his conception of the crises from Ericsson's ideas about what we struggle with. So we're going to go through them and get you to start considering what polarities you experience um, in terms of age ranges and and how that fits with your perceptions around what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. So, 
can you find another partner? Might be nice if you chose somebody different. And find yourself some space in the room. And what we'd like to do is to explore between you, so make sure you both get the opportunity to have a voice. What is your attitude to the young and what's your attitude to the old? These are really, really quite important questions because this is where you're positioning yourself, this is where you're at. The, the, the young was once you, the old is what you're becoming. So exploring what your attitudes are here will enlighten something in you as to where you're at. Okay? Three very important areas when you're looking at lifespan development, age, uh, purpose, which is what creativity and, and uh, is about, because for anything to be created, something tends to be destructed before that. It's part of the process of life and growth. And, of course, gender. And if we look at through every kind of lifespan theory, and if you went on to look at other ones, all of them talk about polarities and crises and paradox. Because if you think as you're developing through life, this is what it's all about, isn't it? This is what happens. You experience paradox, polarities, crises. This is how we, we gauge things, and we're fitting somewhere in the middle, perhaps pushing away from one place, gravitating towards another, um, and this is what it is to be a, an organism. This is part of what it is to be alive. You know, without challenges and without struggles, we don't always find what we're looking for, do we? They're important. But your clients won't be telling you that. <laughs> They'll be coming to you wanting not to be experiencing this, not to feel it. Of course, your job is not to say to them, well, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> it, it isn't helpful. Yeah, it's not, it's not. <laughs> It's not helpful, the glass is half full, you know, and it's just like, it's just, you know, cheer up. Cheer up, could be worse. Think of all the starving children in Africa and all this sort of stuff. It's not helpful, but you recognize that you have there, when you're holding this, a really, it's a really big responsibility, isn't it? It would be remiss of me to talk, uh, not to um, just say that uh, the last kind of decade of Levinson's life couldn't tolerate it anymore without having done a study on women. So he did with the help of his wife and, and, uh, and, and some, and some other, other women and was shocked to find that women also experienced these same stages. <laughs> okay. But at different ages. At different ages because their journey through life is different to men's. They're, they're different things happen but the stages remain the same. The struggles remain the same. Uh, something that I suddenly, you know, really, really grounded me as a therapist, but also helped me mature and, and have empathy more for people and my clients. So, uh, keep relating to when you're working with clients and it will help guide you.